can't any, think of any other ideas from the Pasha. So this is continuing the uh, the uh, theme of uh, personal development. Uh, okay, so it says, uh, um, peep, you get people in life who always look negative and everything is bad and um, they, uh, they never find anything good. They're always going to criticize people and uh, I don't know, we may, some of us may, may know people like this and they criticize every single little thing and it's so insignificant and, and silly and it's, it's a small mindedness and uh, I know, I know people who they, they're not happy within themselves and they criticize others and eventually that leads that criticism leads to lotion horror and gossip and it's uh, it's just negative negative talk and we need to try avoid toxicity um, for our own benefit just to uh, drain our energy and uh, yeah that's uh, I've actually lost the I lost the, I lost the place for some reason but I saw about an hour or so ago so that's um, so it leads, yeah, it leads to it eventually leads to lots and horror and gossip about people, and um, I'm actually I, I'm friendly with people who uh, who are not on our level of, of, of Yiddishkeit or level or who are not involved in Yiddishkeit, and I tell them after I tell people, what are you, what are you, what are you gain, what are you gaining from telling gossiping? Do you feel do you feel good about yourself? Is it such a wonderful thing you've done? They can't answer me. Yeah, so yeah. understand. Uh, yeah, honest, yeah. I actually did love doing it, and I missed it. But uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just being I'm just being real. Uh, it it was so fun running people down, even for no reason or for a good reason. It doesn't matter. It was just, it was just such fun. Was there anything on the religion that I've really battled to come to groups with? Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 unless it's for obviously for a constructive purpose, or you know what I mean. Yeah, but, I, think, um, I think the rules governing to how to warn people about shidduchim and certain other things, if they or a business partner potentially that could be damaging. So, but certainly uh, in most cases, Kevin, you are hundred percent right. So we don't have long, uh, guys. We've got about twenty-eight minutes. Um. So let's just go through, yeah, uh, concepts quickly. Now, we discussed, um, to, well, we're discussing today that the Gemara is presenting a different version of the preceding discussion, and there are those who say that this matter of whether Rabbi Meir holds that a change effects acquisition. Or doesn't. That's not the issue. It was never a question to us. Okay. Because since Rav reversed the opinion cited in the Mishnah regarding the stolen animal and slaves that aged, and he teaches the Mishnah in a different way. Okay. He teaches it as follows If one stole an animal and it aged, or slaves, and they aged, the robber pays their value as of the time of the robbery. Those are the words of Rabbi Meir. So if that was the case, it means that as the slaves deteriorated in age, there was a physical as well as a um, animal. It, it was a physical deterioration. And therefore, that physical change rendered it the property of the robber and because of the deterioration, the robber has to make financial restitution uh, at the timeline at which he robbed uh, either the slave or the animal. So therefore, according to this, Rabbi Meir holds that a physical change does affect acquisition. Okay, because in this case, is a deterioration. Now, uh, Rav is saying that the rabbis say to the contrary. He's saying, but the sages say in the case of slaves, the robber may say to the original owner, behold, what is yours is before you. Meaning that with regards to slaves in this version, 
the rabbis see a slave as fixed property, like land, and therefore that can never be owned by the robber, and that's returned even with a deterioration of aging to the original owner. So it is certain that according to Rabbi Meir, change does affect acquisition class. And here in the Brasa, where he states that a robber must return the offspring and the short wall, it's a penalty that Rabbi Meir imposes. Because if you look at the first Brasa, it says um, when he stole a pregnant uh, cow uh, or a ewe laden with wool, and both of those developed to where the ewe grew its wool. Uh, um, more prolifically, or the fetus became a calf, what should happen then is that item belongs to the robber and he recompensates the robber at the time of the robbery. But we can see because uh, uh, that is a physical change and that would affect an acquisition for Rabbi Meir. But we see in that first price of where there's appreciation to the robber's benefit, Rabbi Meir imposes a penalty ensuring that the robber doesn't gain the upper hand in this case. Okay, so change does affect uh, acquisition, according to Rabbi Meir. So we can see it's a penalty. The question is something different. The question here is, um, is uh, does Rabbi Meir impose this penalty only where a thief or robber acted deliberately, in other words, with intent to steal? Like, the, like that first Bryce, uh, when he stole the pregnant cow or the ewe uh, um, laden to be shorn? Or do we say in the case of the haberdashery shop with the dyer who technically stole from the customer because he didn't fa he failed to listen to him properly and didn't dye the wool the correct color, which in that case was inadvertent. He didn't mean to steal. Rabbi Mad does not pose a penalty. Okay, so we're saying in that case, is it different? So in the case of inadvertent theft or uh, non-purposeful theft, he doesn't impose a penalty, but in deliberate acts of theft and breaking, he does. That's one way to interpret it. The other way is perhaps even when he acted inadvertently, Ravi Mayer also imposes the penalty. And what did Kevin ask last night, which was very astute, he, he was saying, well, how do you know somebody's intent? And we said there was two logical ways to deal with it. The first way to deal with it is that you don't even have to ask that question. That's the Gemara saying is if there was an act of theft, maybe intent is irrelevant. So that's the one way to look at it. We use the example of somebody hitting the back of your car. Uh, if somebody purposefully was irritated with you and they rammed in the back of your car, or if they were just driving um, in a uh, careless way, but they certainly didn't do it intentionally because they didn't want to damage their own car either, by the way, they smacked into the back of you or they didn't keep a correct following distance, either way your car is damaged. So therefore, intent doesn't matter to the overall damage. That's the one opinion. The other one, that intent does very much matter. And there's a difference between uh, breaking the law and making a mistake and not breaking the law, um, uh, where intent counts. Um, so we're going to see where it uh, plays out here. So the Gemara attempts to resolve the inquiry. It says, come learn a resolution. From the following Brysa. There are five creditors that collect only from unsold properties. And they are those who have a claim of produce and the improvement of produce. Okay? We dealt with this the other day, but I'm just giving you a summary. One who accepts upon himself to sustain the son or daughter of his wife if they've had children through, uh, if she's had children through previous um, marriage and therefore uh, when he marries this wife it's her second marriage and he is prepared to sustain son or the daughter then there is uh, one who comes to collect with a debt document that does not have a guarantee in it ok 
Okay. Now, you're saying the borrower in this case didn't mortgage his properties to the lender at the time of the loan. And he didn't write in the loan document the clause, all my properties are pledged as security for this loan. That's the way it's ex expressed by Russia, which is clear. So since the borrower's properties were never mortgaged to this loan, the creditor cannot collect the debt from properties that the borrower has since sold. Okay. Now, and one who collects a woman's ketubah that does not have a guarantee written within it. Exactly the same concept. Now, whom did you hear say that he counts, he collects the principal even from sold property? Okay, so what we are saying here is that properties that the robber had sold, after he sold the stolen property to the buyer, in that particular case, um, the original owner comes and kidnaps the property back that's rightfully his from the buyer who bought stolen property. But there was a guarantee that the buyer had that was contained in the deed of sale. Uh, sorry, my blood sugar is low. The deed of sale. Okay. So that basically, guys, has the force of a loan obligation recorded in a loan document. And what that does is it creates a lien on one's properties. So in that case, the situation perpetuates itself, uh, like in Baba Basra 175A. So the buyer now can collect the principal, in other words, what he paid for the stolen property, from lands legitimately owned by the robber at the time of the sale, even if those lands have subsequently been sold. So what the base then does is it has a timeline, and the robber has obviously been conning people left, right, and center. And just say it's the year, tw um, it, it was uh, a year ago. And the pro the robber might have had five properties. He might have stolen many title deeds and properties. And he might have had one or two genuinely himself. But this is eventually going to catch up with him. So what happens is somebody can prove that the land and the title deed uh, was stolen from him, and he goes to claim back the land from the buyer. The buyer then has a guarantee in the sale that the robber uh, has to recompensate him from uh, his property. Now, if he cannot get the money from his uh, property at this stage, because the robber has sold all of his assets, to a third party, the buyer can collect it from one of those other third parties because there's a lien on that property guaranteeing that he can collect it. And that's what enables the buyer to have the property taken from him, from the original owner, for a very similar reason. So whether it's a stolen property or a creditor and debtor situation, you're dealing with a similar sort of concept of a guarantee and a lien. Okay, so that's as far as that's concerned. Now, when if the buyer is collecting the principal and improvements from the robber, we see um, that, well, firstly, there's two parts. As Gavin said two days ago, the principal correctly is taken uh, from a property uh, uh, that... Uh, the robber sold to someone else because he bought it and thought it was real. So the actual property value he can collect from someone else's property. But the improvements he made to the property in terms of the costs, etc., if they were 50%, he can't get from unsold property, he can't get from sold properties because the improvements don't have a lien within it in terms of a guarantee to collect from unsold properties. It only has a lien guarantee, the improvements, from uh, unsold properties. Okay, so again, uh, I buy a property from somebody, I think it's real. I buy a title deed, uh, somebody comes to take the property back from me, the original owner. Or maybe in this case, it's a creditor and the debtor owed the creditor the, and, and basically had a lien on my property, which he then sold to me. It gets taken away from me, but I made improvements on it 
and if SAT was worth 200 zoos, I made improvements of 100 zoos. Now, I cannot go to, um, um, if this happened last year in, in June, I can't go to that timeline and take 300 zoos away from um, a property that was sold by the debtor or a robber to another party because that is both the original land and the improvement. What I can do is collect from sold properties only my principal of what I paid for the property, the 200 zoos. Now that 100 zoos remaining in terms of improvement, I can only collect that from the debtor or the robber, the original person that did be bad. And that's great if he has unsold assets, but if all his assets are sold, I'm not going to be able to get back the improvements. Does that make sense, guys? It's very straightforward. That part. Yeah. Fine. So let's now build a, a step upon that. So now if the buyer is collecting the principal and improvements from the robber, we see that the original owner of the land comes and takes from the buyer both his land and his improvements. Okay. So the land that he brought and the improvements that he made. Now we are not dealing. Uh, now it's it's basically saying that otherwise the buyer wouldn't be co uh, would not be collecting these things from the robber or the seller. So it's true that land can't be legally stolen as such, guys, and therefore the improved land belongs to the original owner according to basic law. That's a fact. But the implication is that the original owner takes back the improved land without compensating the buyer for the cost of the improvements, okay? But that's bizarre because it's, it says generally when you improve somebody else's field without the owner's knowledge, the owner must recompensate him for the expenses that he made, and that's in government CR 101A. So, but the Bryce here is ruling that the owner does not compensate the buyer for the improvements that he made. It's evident that it's authored by Rabbi Meir, who pen penalizes the buyer. So what it's saying is, is that we're learning a separate case here. And that case is, it's saying, listen, the buyer didn't buy it perhaps without knowledge, or might have bought it with knowledge, but we don't know if he was in on the act of theft, or he was just too stupid to ask the right questions. So either way, the original owner is entitled to get back not only what that land is worth, but the improvements are worth. So how does he collect that? So he collects all of it from uh, the property that was stolen from him, even if the robber sold it to someone else. So now all of a sudden, the buyer has got a claim against the robber. But then how come in this particular case that it seems that he is penalized, um, the buyer, and he loses uh, basically, just hang on a second. Um, let me just check the Gamora here. Um, So we're saying, okay, so basically the buyer is, sorry guys, I'm feeling a bit rotten. Buyer is penalized in this case. It would seem. Why? Because you don't buy a property without checking out the case history. Two things can happen to that property. Number one, uh, it is actually uh, used as a guaranteed in a lien against a debt. Or it could be that that property is stolen. So the onus is on the buyer to, uh, the buyer beware, as the Latin phrase goes, to check it out. So the Gemara is saying, uh, now maybe we're dealing with the buyer who is an unlearned person. In other words, he doesn't know whether land can be legally stolen or not. What do you mean? Is even if you're going to say that the buyer was aware that the field was stolen, even let's just say it was somehow aware, it might be referring to where somebody's ignorant. Because you might be dealing with somebody that thinks, oh, well, land certainly can't really uh, be stolen because I learned somewhere that land is fixed. Okay, so that's a bit simple. So the Rashba says you can ask in a different way. 
maybe you're dealing with a buyer that wasn't even aware that the field was stolen. And it's not a, necessarily an unlearned person. Maybe it's just an ignorant person that failed to check out the history. But an unlearned person thinks that just as in the case of stolen movables, it's, it's different. Why? Because we learned that the change of domain from the robber to the buyer effects acquisition in conjunction with the original owner's despair. Remember, guys, we learned about um, Yerush, Yerush. So remember despair. So you have to have the original owner's despair mixed with a, a, a change of domain from the robber to the buyer. Therefore, it affects acquisition for the buyer. But that's for movables. That's not for land. So maybe he's thinking in the case of stolen land, that's the case. So when he uses and improves the land for himself, he doesn't realize that he's actually unlawfully modifying land that belongs to the original owner who in whose domain the land remains so that the land cannot be legally stolen. So what we are saying is in a general case, when somebody's doing an improvement for you, you have to recompensate them. So, for example, we mentioned in this case a robbery different to that of a creditor. Because in the case of a creditor, uh, we did learn a case where the improvements had to be paid upon. Why? And we're going to learn it coming out. Because it's a different case. It, it's, it's, it's a case where uh, there was legitimate improvements and compensation has to be made. But this is a case of robbery, not in the credit and the debtor. So what we are trying to figure out is uh, this is an inadvertent act, and we can see that Rabbi Mayer imposes a penalty. What penalty did he impose? Well, when it was confiscated by the buyer, the original owner uh, uh, took it back. The robber in the guaranteed lien should pay for um, should pay for both the property and the improvements the buyer made. But the robber is only meant to pay in this particular case for the, what do you call it, the land itself, not the improvements. Which means if the buyer was part of the problem, because without buyers of stolen radios, you don't have stolen radios, right? The cars, when there were yeah, a whole spate of them. So we're saying that whether or not he didn't know the property was stolen, or whether or not he was an ignorant person and he thought it's like movables, you're buying something stolen, but uh, a bit of despair, a bit of change of location, and then it becomes the uh, buyers, that's ignorance. In a, either way, it wasn't purposeful. He wasn't the robber himself directly. And therefore, um, let me just let Arthur in. And therefore, A call. No, somebody called me and it uh, uh, cut off my audience. I couldn't hear you. Okay. So what we are saying is, guys, is that this is a case where Rabbi Mayer penalizes someone directly remote removed from the robbery process. Why? The robber is aware that he's done something bad. In this case, this person is either unlearned, where he thinks that legally, if there's a despair on the part of the original owner and a change of location, it's like movables and he gets to keep the land. So that's ignorance. The other thing of it is he doesn't know the land is stolen. If the penalty is imposed against him, where he only gets paid for the principal and not the improvement, it means that um, you're losing Arthur. Sorry, signal dropped there. I it again. So I've cracked. Okay, try it again. I, t I, t I tell you what, guys, uh, Kevin has got in five minutes to uh, to go to this online share. Thing. If it's, uh, it's an extra five minutes, it's okay. I don't mind. You can do an extra 12 minutes. All right. All right. So all we are saying is, guys, the, this is like the haberdashery guy that made, the dyer that made a mistake. Either the guy didn't know he bought stolen property, or he legally thought he could acquire it with a despair and a change of location like movables. Either way, it seems Rabbi Meir uh, punishes this buyer 
because he doesn't get compensated uh, for both the land and the improvements. You get it. He gets compensated for the land that he spent money uh, properly on because he's got a guarantee on the property. He gets that back, but he doesn't get back the improvements. He can't claim that. He can only claim that if there's unsold property from the robber. If the robber sold all of the property to another buyer, that lien is still good for the buyer to be able to collect from somebody else whom he sold it to. Okay? So that helps him to a certain degree, but he's penalized that he can't get back his money on improvements because the lien and the guarantee doesn't extend to the improvements for unsold, uh, for sold properties, only for unsold properties if the robber store has an asset base. So therefore, that ignorance on the part of the buyer is penalized. I'm trying to answer in the case of the haberdashery uh, um, uh, dyer, is there a case where a mistake is made in a store robbery and the person's ignorant they get penalized or not? Or is there a bit of a break that's given to them if they didn't mean to do it or they didn't know it was stolen? So, so far we see this is trying to prove that Robbie May imposes the penalty irrespective. Okay? So the Gemara rejects the proof. It says, no. You think we're dealing with somebody that sees uh, fixed land as movables and is under the false assumption that a change of location and despair affects it for the buyer. Or maybe the buyer didn't know it was stolen. You think we're dealing with this degree of ignorance, and therefore Rabbi Mayer poses the penalty on, on an inadvertent robber compared to a deliberate robber. They're saying this isn't uh, a proof, because maybe we're dealing with a Torah scholar, and he knows that land cannot be stolen. We don't know somebody's mindset, exactly as Kevin said the other day. This is the refutation to it. So when he bought the stolen land, he proved it for himself. He knew that he had not legally acquired the land, and therefore he was at risk when he used somebody else's property unlawfully that he had to pay the penalty of the improvements lost because, yes, the land he bought, and maybe he's got a claim against the, uh, the land from the robber and even a lien on unattached property, uh, on, on sold properties, uh, he can get it back. But the improvements, unless the robber's got an asset base that hasn't been sold, there's no ways that uh, uh, the buyer can get it back from sold properties and damage some other buyer. Okay? So it's saying this is not a proof where the buyer acted inadvertently because we cannot read somebody's mindset. It could be that they knew very well what they were doing. That's what Kevin suggested the other day. So Rabbi Mayer resolves the inquiry. No, uh, not Rabbi May, because I'm, 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 a blood uh, I'm actually losing my mind, sorry. So, come learn, uh, I'm not losing my mind, blood sugar is like, come learn a proof from the following Mishnah, you just read the Mishnah, it's in 100B, if one gave wool to a dyer and instructed him to dye it for red and he dyed it black, we instructed him to dye it black and he dyed it red, he pays the value of the wool only. So, implies the value of the wool he, he pays, but the value of the wool and its improvement, he doesn't pay. So that's why the dyer gets to keep, even though it's physically changed from untreated wool to dyed wool, he gets to keep the value of the wool and the improvement. Okay? Because it has changed its physical property. So we can see it's a penalty, but Rabbi Mayer doesn't impose the penalty on that case because it was accidental uh, and it wasn't ill intent to steal. He misunderstood. But he has to recompensate the original owner for the untreated uh, wool. So there's no loss, but he doesn't have to give the improvements and the benefits away to the original owner. It wasn't intentional. So if it should enter your mind to say that even when one acts inadvertently, Rabbi Ma also imposes a penalty, then you would need to return to the owner, guys, the value of the wool and its improvement. Okay. Rather, do you not learn from this that Rabbi Ma imposes a penalty only when one acts deliberately, guys, like the first bricer of the pregnant cow or the uh, 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 that, um, that needs to be shorn. But when one acts inadvertently, he does not impose a penalty. The Gemara says, indeed, learn from this. So the bottom line is, um, only when it's inadvertent, um, 
is the penalty wavered, but if it's a deliberate act of theft, the penalty is enforced. And because we cannot judge somebody's mindset, in that previous case, we couldn't imply uh, that it was out of ignorance either. Right, guys, we're done. I know we've got seven many minutes left, but I'm done, believe me. Can't hear you, Kev. No, you looked at that. Thanks for, I mean, you probably you look a bit tired and thanks for giving us a share. It's uh, you did very really well. Thanks, yeah, guys. Thanks well. for the support. That's very sweet. All right. Hey, man, if you yeah. change your mind about shopping,